From Lisbon, we head north to the university town of Coimbra. This is a great, small, like mini Lisbon, famous for its university, which is one of the oldest in Europe. You can see it up on the hilltop here. The old part of the town has all this great, beautiful architecture, pedestrian streets all lined in marble. It can be a bit slick if it's rainy, so be careful. And then you can walk up to the castle. You have sort of two, or up to the university, you have sort of two options. You can walk through the main part of the city. At the end, there's an elevator that takes you up. Or you can walk this way, kind of up, wind up the little streets. Rick has a great little walking tour in his book where you kind of take the elevator up and then you walk back down this street from the university. You'll see some graffiti up there near where all the fraternities are. These guys don't like McDonald's very well. The gate of the university and you can tour the university itself. It's quite a beautiful place, especially the library here. This has some of the oldest books in Europe. And this picture I kind of snuck. You're not supposed to take photographs inside. So I kind of held my camera and took it. But it's got all this beautiful carved woodwork with gold overlay. And if you go in May, that's when the students are graduating. So you'll see a lot of students around town in these caps and gowns. And uh, Coimbra is unique in that it has this type of fado where it's only sung by men. You will have these male groups going around singing fado music. And just outside you have some Roman ruins of Conimbria. These are not as impressive as something you'd see out of you know, Rome, for instance, but some of the best mosaic floors I've seen. They're pretty fantastic. From here we head north to Porto. This is the working town. And Rick says, uh, or in his book, that Coimbra or uh, Porto works while Lisbon plays. And it's a bit of a workaday, kind of a grungy town, but it's really having this rebirth these last couple years, and there's a lot of construction and remodeling going on. It's a fantastic city, I think. The River Douro runs right through it, where you have all these old wine boats. And the, on the other side of the river is where all the port wine lodges are. So if you, want, if you really like port wine and you want to do some port wine tasting, you can go over there. And there's quite a few of them that we list in our guidebook. Um, there's so many different types of wine. The first port wine, the first time I came to Porto, I was shocked. I didn't think I liked port. But there's all these different ones. Some of these late bottle vintage ones can be quite expensive for a tasting. So you could spend like $100, $100 for just a taste of it. The area along the river called the Ribera has all these beautiful kind of unique buildings. I really like, to one of my favorite hotels we list in the book is here, the Guest House Duro. And it's been remodeled, one of these old Ribera houses. Also, the Stock Exchange Palace, which you think, how could that be an interesting site? But it actually is pretty cool. They built it to really impress people for, to um, attract foreign trade. They didn't let you take any pictures inside, but all the various rooms are decorated. They have a Moroccan room that's all done in this plaster work. Um, they have another one that's all done with gold, gold leaf and inlay. And they do English language tours almost hourly there, so it's a really easy place to visit. There's also another wine tasting center just to the right. The main square, Avenida de Aliados, this has a lot of great Art Nouveau architecture. And one of the coolest McDonald's you will ever see. So I kind of have mixed feelings about this McDonald's because you see this all over Europe. I've seen this in Tallinn, in the old city wall. They're this really old historic part of the city that there's a McDonald's built there. Well, in this case, this was an old um, cafe from the 1800s that was slated to be torn down. And McDonald's bought the property, and they left it pretty much as it was. They, they left the interior intact with all the stained glass. They even left the old coffee bar in there. So, it's even a cool place just to pop in and take a look at. It's one of the stops on Rick's walking tour in Porto. But it's also the classiest place, I think, to have a Big Mac if you really want one. Wow. This is my favorite church in all of Portugal. It's the Tile Church. And I just love all this blue and white azulejo tile that's all covered all over it. The other church there, this is kind of the symbol of uh, Porto. You see it sticking up the um, Claragos Tower. And you can climb the steps to the very top for this fantastic view overlooking Porto. Very famous bookstore here that, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard a rumor that J.K. Rowling, who wrote um, Harry Potter, was really inspired by this bookstore. And now, it used to just be a regular bookstore, but now you have to pay uh, an entrance fee to go in. But it's just beautiful. It's got this beautiful wooden stairway. 
And I think the entrance fee actually helps to keep the place up and, and keep it going. The old train station here, the San Bento train station, this is not the station that you would arrive if you're coming from Coimbra or Lisbon, um, but you could take a connecting train from that station to this station. And inside has these beautiful tile murals depicting all the history of Portugal. From here we move on to the Douro Valley and you have these terraced hillsides with all these wine grapes. You can take a boat from um, Porto for the day to go up here if you want to just go for the day and then either come back by uh, bus or train or you could go up and spend a couple nights. I think it's really better to have a car up here. You can stay at a small little quinta um, or one of the posadas up there, do some wine tasting. The main town, Peso de Regua, I don't think is a highlight as far as you know, a beautiful little town, but it's a really good transportation hub because you can take the train here or the boat. Lot of wineries. This is one of the ones we list in our book, Quinta de Moracos, small family run little winery and you can rent a room there and stay. It's a fantastic place to stay. You also have some posadas just outside of town and it's a beautiful old manor house that was turned into a posada. Inside all this tile work and a fantastic view. So there's a lot of these type of posadas in the, all over the Douro Valley that you can find on that posadas website. Now we're going to head back down south towards, um, heading back down towards the southern part of the country. We have Nazare on the west coast. This is an old fishing village that's turned into a resort town and has some of the biggest surfing waves in the world. If you come here in the summer, it can be quite crowded. <laughs> and you can rent these little tents. <coughs> They do still have some traditional life that survives. The women here are known for wearing these seven layered petticoats. And this lady's drying fish on the fish racks. A lot of them will rent rooms in their house. So if you're looking for a place to stay, you can actually show up in a place like Nazare and they will have these little books with pictures of their home and you can rent a room there. And they'll take you to their house and stay very, very affordably. Once you go past the main square, there's a lot of these little quiet little back streets that are loaded with some small seafood restaurants where the locals eat. The main square, you can take a funicular up to the top. The city's kind of divided into two parts. You have the, the, the lower town where the beach is, and then the upper town, you take this funicular up, it's called Sitio. And up there, you have these little viewpoints overlooking the sea and the fantastic view overlooking Nazare. Um, up there is also where you have the cathedral, the Lady of Nazare Church. And this gal who's always up there every time I go there, she's selling nuts and little uh, paracebis, which are these um, barnacles. They're actually quite large, about the size of your finger. And you think, barnacles, it doesn't sound very good. But Portuguese people love to steam these barnacles, and then they eat them. They kind of pop them out. It's almost like a little shrimp. And they have it with a cold beer. Very unique. Near there, you have three important religious sites. You have Alcobasa, which is a um, beautiful church. It's famous for um, the burial place of the Portuguese Romeo and Juliet, Pedro and Ines. And we have a whole little story in our guidebook that tells you all about that. Second important church, Bataya. This is the site of a very famous battle that the Portuguese repelled a Spanish invasion. And inside has this beautiful stonework and one of the most important Catholic pilgrimage sites in Europe, Fatima. If you come on the 12th to the 13th of the month, it's going to be quite crowded. There's a lot of pilgrims who come from all over Portugal, all over Europe, really. And they like to walk this esplanade that goes between the two. You have the cathedral here and then this church on the other end. And you'll see people walking on their knees the whole length of it. Um, just south of there, we have Obidos, the cute little, cute little uh, castle town. This also has a posada. You can stay in right in the entrance of the town. And these, it's all surrounded by medieval walls. Got to be a little careful because there's no railings here. This is just a lawsuit in the making if this was the US. <laughs> the entrance of the city with the main gate, you have this beautiful tile work. The top, this is no longer tile. It's been painted because during the 1755 earthquake, that all fell down and they never did put it back up. Very narrow little streets all lined with chocolate shops and little restaurants. Beautiful little town. It's one of my favorite places to stay the night, actually, because most people just go here as a day trip from Lisbon. It can be really crowded. But if you stay the night, you have the town to yourself. Um, further south, we have Evora in the Alentejo region. This is a university town and very old. It's been, uh, it's been a town since Roman times. It's known for its Roman temple. It also has another posada right behind it that you can stay in. That's an old monastery. 
and famous for its bone chapel. If anybody's been to um, Kutnahora in the Czech Republic, they had a similar chapel there. It's all lined with human bones and some very narrow little streets. I really like this little sign here, and they have it in, in Portuguese and English saying, is your car small enough to fit? Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I did not try to drive my car through that. I mean, that is a really small space. But you can tell that people have tried to drive through here. <laughs> Another reason to have a very small car when you're renting a car in Portugal. Just outside of Evora, you have this old stone circle that's 1,000 years older than Stonehenge. And the first time I went here, I was really surprised there was nobody there. Now, it's not as impressive as something you'd see in Stonehenge, but just the fact that these rocks are still surviving after all this time is pretty impressive to me. And you can see these faint carvings in them. There's a guy we list in our book um, who does tours out of, his name's Mario, and he does tours out of Ebera. He has a company called Ebera Megalithic, and he knows everything about all the prehistoric sites around Ebera. You can hire him for the day. He will pick you up at your hotel and take you out to some of these stone circles. It's pretty interesting. On the south coast of Portugal, we have um, three towns that we like. Tavera is one of them. It's over near the Spanish border. Most of the Algarve has kind of become like the south coast of Spain. It's a lot of golf resorts, a lot of um, northern Europeans and Brits, so it doesn't really feel Portuguese. But there's a few of these three little towns that really do. Tavera is a nice little place. I really like it. It has a very old stone Roman bridge, nice little park. But they do concerts here sometimes in the summer. And near there is a little island called Ila, Ila del Tavera. And you have to take a little boat out there. But it's a little sandbar. has all beautiful sand beach there. From here we go to Lagos, which is um, one of the largest towns on the Algarve coast. Some very interesting rock formations and beaches around Lagos, including some caves a little further east. And the old town has is, is, got a lot of maze of narrow pedestrian streets. I really like this tile building in the square here. This whole, it's kind of a modern kind of green tile, but at the top, even these are tiles. And it's famous for the original slave market. So most of the African slaves that came to the New World came through Lagos. And this is the old slave market building. It's now been turned into a museum, which is kind of interesting to see, I think. We end in Salema, which is Rick's favorite little Portuguese back door. If you want a place to just chill out and relax, this is a great place to go. And I always end my trips in Portugal and Salema because I like to just chill out on the beach, drink some caipirinhas, have some good seafood, and relax. The beach here is quite nice. The town's kind of divided into two parts. You have the old town here below, and then up above, this is a lot of the condos that are owned by Brits and Germans, so a more modern part of the town. It's one of the few places you'll ever see Rick relax. <coughs> And here he is at one of, his, one of our favorite uh, hotels we list in the guidebook, the Pension Mare. It really just has one main street going through the old town. And then the beach there, beautiful. I just love to swim here every day. It still is a fishing town, so there are fishermen who fish every day here, mainly for octopus. They put these pots down in the water. Octopus crawl into the pots. They think it's safe, and then they pull the pots up, and the octopus are in the pots. Really nice to walk on, on the beach at sunrise here. Beautiful, beautiful place. And then just west of there, an easy day trip if you have a car, you have the far southwest little tip of Europe called Sagres. And Sagres is famous for um, several things. It has these beautiful cliffs and fantastic surfing beaches here. A lot of surfers love this part of Europe. You'll see fishermen fishing right off the edges of the cliffs. And Henry the Navigator had a fort here. It really did look like the end of the world. You could see this sort of windswept, barren landscape, and you can understand why people thought that this is where the world ended. There's an old sundial. Well, they think it was a sundial. They're not really sure. And then these cliffs that just drop off right into the sea. Obrigado. 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 Thank you very much.